Well, good morning, everyone. It certainly is good to see everyone out. I know we have a lot that were traveling last week, and it's good to see you out this morning. We have some that are visiting. You're traveling our way, and we're certainly glad that you've chosen to be here. I ask that everyone would take out a Bible and be following along with me. If your Bible's not out already, so we're at the part of our worship where we're going to be studying from the Word of God. You know, in my notes, I had something uh, that I had planned to say about how next week, uh, although it won't be the fifth Sunday since I'm out of town, uh, Patrick Davis was scheduled to preach next week, and that was something that he was really looking forward to months in advance, getting his notes together, and so I'm sure that uh, he'll still be out of town next week. So I don't know who will be preaching, someone will in my absence, but I know Patrick could definitely use our encouragement, and Heather as well, and uh, I know eventually he'll be up here to present that lesson. He spent a lot of time in that, and I look forward to the day when he's able to have his strength back in every sense of the word to be able to present that lesson. Before we jump too far in this lesson, I want to share something that's a little bit lighthearted from the previous note I was just talking about. But I remember one of my teachers in high school showed us a video, and the, the video title was Test Your Awareness. And the video began and it said you had to count the passes that the team in white made. And that seemed pretty easy. Some of you, are by your reaction, you know what video I'm talking about. Uh, there were two teams, and, and you know, pretty easy to keep track of. You count the team in white, how many passes they make. It finishes 13 passes. Pretty easy. And, you know, the, the commentator of the video says, did you count 13 passes? It's like, yeah, that was easy. And then he says, but did you see the moonwalking bear? And at that point, everybody's like, wait, what? Like a moonwalking bear. And it rewinds the video and it plays it all over. And sure enough, you're focused on the white team. But now that you're not counting the passes, you're looking for something. And sure enough, a guy in a bear costume walks out in between everybody making these passes and does like a lame moonwalk. I'm not going to demonstrate it, but like moonwalks off the screen. And the point of the whole ad was it wasn't it was really a commercial that aired in the UK. They have some of the best ads over there. It was an ad that said it's easy to miss something you're not looking for. Look twice for motorcycles. That was the point of the ad, and it was really effective because you are so distracted in the video, you're not looking for a moonwalking bear to just come across the screen, not at all. You're counting the passes that the team of Watt is making. And I think we understand the very definition of what a distraction is. It's something that prevents you from giving your full attention to something else. And let's face it, in our daily lives, all of us get distracted by so many things. But is this really a spiritual issue? Is this really something that we should spend our time talking about in a lesson? And I would say, absolutely. When my distractions rob me of spiritual growth, spiritual responsibilities, spiritual commands, then yes, that's a spiritual issue. One that scripture dives into, and that's what we're going to be studying about in our time this morning. And before I get too much further in this lesson, I want to say this as well. Just because you get distracted at work when you're working on something doesn't mean that you're sinning. I don't want you to think every time you are distracted that that's a sin. Okay, I think the parable of the Good Samaritan is a good illustration that sometimes distractions that come up can be a blessing, can be an opportunity for good. Here the priest and the Levite were walking across the way and some guy is beaten, left for dead. That was an opportunity. That distract them from what they were doing. They should have helped, and they didn't. So not all distractions are sinful. Not all distractions are bad. But I'm talking about in this sermon from the perspective of worldly distractions that interfere with our focus, interfere with our walk as New Testament Christians. That's the kind of perspective that we're going to be talking about in this lesson. So with that being said, I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 10. Let's look at a story where someone was distracted and what happened in that. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 and 42, <coughs> the encounter of Mary and Martha. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. I want you to notice what's going on with Martha. Martha is distracted. 
That's what the text makes clear for us. An idea of that word there for distracted. It's someone who is drawn away. Means to be here and there. They may, mentally, they may physically be in the room, but mentally they're somewhere else. And that's exactly what is happening with Martha. She's, she's busy. I mean, and what, what does this distracted state cause her to be? She's distracted and Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. And I think we can relate to that a lot. That's what our distractions do. They cause our anxiety levels to go up. We're busy. We're all over the place. I think that's an important place for us to begin in this lesson. That most of the time, our distractions are things that aren't sinful in and of themselves. They're the everyday responsibilities, the everyday tasks that we have in this life. In fact, what is Martha distracted by in this text? By serving. She's getting a meal ready. She has Jesus in her house. Can you blame her? And not on top of that, she has no good sister who's not helping at all. And she goes to Jesus and says, Lord, do you not care? Tell my sister to get in here and help. And that's really where we see the key lesson in this encounter. Is Jesus then rebukes her. He rebukes her while Mary, the one that wasn't helping, is praised. And I think we read this story and we relate to it in a lot of ways. Probably because we relate more to Martha than we do to Mary. That fits our description more times than not. We're distracted, and as a result, we're anxious and troubled about many things. Many things is a great summary. I don't know what the specific thing is, but for us, for a lot of us, it's many things. A lot of things are on our minds. We're distracted. Maybe in this story, we, we see in Martha a snapshot of ourselves. It's, it's a never-ending list of things that can distract us. It's the text. It's the cleaning. It's the unfinished yard work. It's social media. Did you know at the rate we're going that an average American will spend five and a half years of their life on social media? We could be distracted with that. We have jobs. We have emails. We have family matters to tend to. All of this, it eats away at our time. It eats away at our attention. And what happens? Well, another week comes and another week goes. We fail at serving God because we're so distracted. Our schedules are full with, yeah, they're full with non-sinful things, but like Martha... They steal our attention away from what truly matters. And here's the point that I want to establish before we go any further in this lesson. That when all of our non-sinful tasks distract us from spiritual disciplines, that is a spiritual issue. And that is something that I hope you look inward and you examine your own life and see if that's an issue in your life. That our distractions, they often come at a cost. We remember a passage like Matthew 6 and verse 33, which commands us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. That's the priority. That's what our life, our pursuit is all about. But so many times we give God the scraps of our time, the scraps of our attention, because everything else is penciled in. The schedule is full. We don't have any time for God. Maybe, perhaps, we need to look inward. We need to look at our calendar and see, are we too distracted for God? And there's a lot of directions that this lesson could go. But I want to be specific as we move forward and address one area of our lives that may be distracting us more than anything else. That I would argue that we're not just a distracted people, we are a digitally distracted people. <coughs> have you ever stopped and considered how digitally advanced we're becoming? We have watches that can now detect a heart attack or a fall. Or if you forget your credit card, that's okay, you can just pay with your watch. We can download textbooks and movies in a matter of seconds. We can use our phone to, in real time, record what someone is saying in another language and have it replay to us and hear what, they're say, what they were saying in our own language. It's amazing the, the blessings even that our technology affords us today. We're becoming more and more efficient than ever before. But like I said, our distractions, they come at a cost. It means that more times than not, we're distracted more than, other, uh, more than ever before, among many other consequences. You know, in, in the year 2000, it was believed that the average American attention span was 12 seconds. 12 seconds, not really that high to begin with. But in 2013, studies show that it had already fallen off to 8 seconds, estimating that today in 2022, as low as 6 seconds. A goldfish has an attention span of 9 seconds. That's how bad our attention span is. And you know, I know we laugh at that, but could that maybe explain why there's a lot of shallow Christians in the world today? 
If our attention span is so short that we can't dig into God's word, we can't commune with him in prayer, we can't meditate upon spiritual things, how do we expect to grow? Worse, how do we expect to know God, have a meaningful relationship with him? Solomon reminds us in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. There really isn't. The same cycles and patterns of the earth continue now just as they did in the beginning. And as people in the Old Testament and New Testament were distracted, Christians today are tempted with distractions. But the means by which we are distracted has changed. It could be that 20, 30 years from now, this lesson about digitally distracted could change into something else. But in our day and time today, I think this is one of the greatest temptations we face as Christians. Because being distracted from God and His Word, it's a temptation people have always faced. But maybe this is something that faces us in an alarming way today. And I know I'm going to be focusing in this lesson mainly on phones, and some of you, especially who are older, that may not be a temptation for you. You may not even know how to work the smartphone. You know, that's okay. But a lot of the principles here apply to the TV. They apply to our jobs. They apply to a lot of other areas uh, that we, I think, will be able to see. But I think one of the biggest vulnerabilities we face, in addition to our phones being an idol, something we talked a little bit about in class, The idea of how idolatry is a problem today, not just something we bow down. And worse, we carry it in our pocket. That's what we do with our idols. But they distract us to death. The presence of our phones and our devices, they're annoying, they're exhausting. They've infiltrated every aspect of our life. Have you thought about that? We carry them in our pockets. We look at them when we're driving, even though we're not supposed to. We ignore work for them. We ignore our family members for them. We eat with them. And you all know we're guilty of using the restroom with them, too. Do you know studies find that about one out of every five phones has fecal matter on it? Just something to think about there. That our phones have literally become a natural extension of our bodies. One study asked young adults ages 18 to 24 if they would rather break a bone or their phone. 46% said that they would rather break a bone. People would rather suffer... Physical harm, then go through the separation anxiety of their phone not working. And worse, I tested that study out to see if it was real when I was in Florida uh, with some of the college students at the congregation there. I think Bailey was actually in that class, uh, and she was not the person that said this. But I asked the students, I said, hey, would you rather break a bone or your phone? And most of them didn't really answer at first, and one kid said, well, what bone are we talking about? (laughs) And that was alarming to hear. I asked my soccer players. Majority of them said, rather break a bone. As long as it wouldn't affect them playing soccer, they'd break a hand. They'd break a a finger. That just signifies that we have a problem. And you know, you do some studies on this, and it makes sense why people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, names we're familiar with, they restricted their kids from computers and phones. Did you know that? They wouldn't let their kids use it. Because they knew the danger, they knew the purpose behind it, that it was meant to be something you couldn't set down. Those of you that have smart watches of any type, I'm wearing one right now. Did you know that the different vibrations that they send through your wrist are designed to be irresistible? That's from Apple's website. That it's, the stimulation is meant to be irresistible, that you can't ignore it. And the science breaks this up, it backs this up. When people get notifications of any type, not just on their wrist, but on their phone, the brain is showing that now in today's time, it's releasing dopamine to the brain. Some of you know what dopamine is. Dopamine is the chemical that is released when you are enjoying something, something that's pleasurable is happening. It's often linked with things like drugs, nicotine, sex. That's what dopamine is tied to. Now, phones. Phones. You know, Matthew 22, 36 through 38, arguably one of the most well-known passages in the Bible, where Jesus is asked, what is the great commandment in the law? And you know, I would hope that you know, if you don't, that's all right. Listen to what Jesus says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. That's what it's all about. But one author said this, it's difficult to serve God with our whole heart, our whole strength, our our whole mind, when we are diverted and distracted and multitasking everything. And I think he's spot on. 
We're so distracted. We're being pulled in so many different directions. We're being lured to our screen. And we don't have time for God. We're too busy for Him. We have a condition of one that, that's spiritual ADD. Attention deficit disorder. You know, how can I love the Lord with all my heart when I'm so distracted and putting my attention in everything else? And this is the challenge that we face in our day and time, that God demands our all, but our distractions, well, they do just that. They distract us from God. I want you to understand, I'm not here to bash technology. I'm not here to bash phones. They do great things. Hey, I'm wearing an Apple Watch. I'm preaching from an iPad. I'm not trying to come across as a hypocrite. If you're using your, your phone as a Bible app, that's great. It can do some really cool features. Because your phone is not the problem. Your phone, at the end of the day, is not really even the blame for our distractions. It's a means by which our problem may be manifested. But you want to know what the real problem is? This is probably what you're not going to like. The problem is you. The problem is you. Your phone is an inanimate object, incapable of acting on its own. You are the problem. I am the problem. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. We spent a lot of time last week in this passage. Some of you may be thinking, I accidentally left this on the handout. You know, does this go with last week's lesson? No, this serves a purpose here. Remember what that passage says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, what are we supposed to do? Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God talked about, hey, well, sometimes in this life, the book of Hebrews is all about hanging on to your faith. Don't lose it. Don't walk away from Jesus. And so what are we supposed to do when we get tired on our spiritual walk? We don't just lay aside things that are sinful. That's a part of it, obviously. But also, as we're told, to lay aside every weight. Things that are heavy. Things that slow us down. Things that get in the way. Perhaps that's our phone. Perhaps that's our devices, the things of this world that, again, aren't sinful in and of themselves. But easily they chip away at our time. They, tip, they chip away at our devotion to God. If I'm distracted with anything that keeps me from looking to Jesus, then I need to take serious stock of my life and be willing to make the necessary sacrifices, the necessary changes. Can I give you some warnings about, against distractions? Some warnings about distractions that we need to take serious stock into. I want to present three of these as we start to wrap up this lesson. First, understand, distractions can push God out. Push God out, and I kind of left that blank. Not out of our heart. I think that's included. Out, out of our mind, out of our life, all of that. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus, we see in that chapter, he began to teach in parables. Probably one of the most familiar parables to many people is the parable of the sower. And I won't read that whole uh, parable, but I'll just remind you of the different types of soil uh, in that parable. Remember, you have the wayside. The seed is sown, and it goes on the wayside, and what happens? Well, it doesn't anything, really. It bounces right off. The birds come up and eat it. The seed never takes root. And then you have the rocky soil, and that seed did take root, but didn't have any depth, and so it didn't last. Then you have the thorny soil. That took root, and it lasted, but the cares of the world had choked it out. And then you have the good soil. It produced, and it bore more. I want you to think about this. When we are distracted in our life, which soil do we most closely represent? I think you could make an argument, technically, for maybe the rocky soil, maybe. But I would suggest to you that we look a lot like the thorny soil. Remember what's said about the thorny soil as Jesus gives the parable and he explains its meaning. Matthew 13 and verse 22 says, As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. That's what the seed represents, the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. The thorny soil runs into the problem. The, the word has taken root. It's deep. It's lodged in the heart, but other things get in there. And they get in the way. And again, what we see is the deceitfulness of riches. We can do a whole lesson on that. But the cares of the world, the distractions of this life. The question we need to ask ourselves is, have our distractions pushed God right out of our life? 
Have our distractions pushed God out of our heart? If we fail to manage life's distractions prudently and wisely, we may forget how to walk with the Lord. And that's a frightening thought. Average American right now is spending about six hours a day on their phone. Six hours a day on our phone. How much time does that leave us for spiritual things? Even logistical question on top of that. How much time does that leave us for our family? For our jobs? For sleep? Where, where do people get this time? And the studies for kids ages 15 to 24, that number gets as close to 10 in some studies. 10 hours a day. You know, we, we hear these passages a lot on where our focus should be. Philippians 4 and verse 8. You know, things that, are, uh, things that are true, things that are just, honorable. Think about these things. Meditate on these things. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Where are minds supposed to be? Set your minds on things above. I would guess that for a number of you, these are pretty familiar verses. Verses you've he- heard very often. But how do, do they really affect how we live? Is that where our mindset is? Is that what we spend our days thinking about? Well, I'm constantly distracted by my phone. You can plug in a lot of things here. My computer, my TV, my job, my Xbox, whatever it may be. Am I not pushing God right out of my life? That's a consequence that comes by living a distracted life. But another warning about distractions is, hey, distractions can close off communion with God. And communion, not just talking about the Lord's Supper, using that word a lot more broadly here. Think back to Luke chapter 10, the story of Mary and Martha. Martha's distracted with much serving. What does she miss? She misses an opportunity to sit at the feet of Jesus, the feet of the Lord. And that's why Jesus said to her in Luke 10 and verse 42, But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Who are we more like in our life? Mary or Martha? Do we choose the good portion? I think Jesus is likely quoting from the 16th Psalm. In verse 5 where it says, The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The Lord is my portion. The Lord is enough. Is that reflected in our life? Once you think about this, when's the last time in your life that you've really made time to pray? Like you've looked at your week ahead, maybe you've looked at just the day, and you said, you know, at this time I need to pray. I'm not talking about before a meal, before the kids go to bed and stuff like that. Like when's the time you've carved out time in your schedule in your life to pray? Can you think back to when that's been? I hope it's recent. When's the last time you've made time to read your Bible? Truly read your Bible. Maybe not even for anything related to a Bible class, but personal study, personal development. Perhaps God feels distant to us because we're not connected to Him. We're so far away. We're so distracted. And that's why I want you to remember what Asher read for us in the Scripture reading. And he did a great job reading that for us. Mark chapter 1. Remember what we were told about Jesus doing Rising early in the morning while it was still dark, he went out to a desolate place. And what did he do? And there he prayed. I know some of you are busy. Perhaps some of you are busier than you should be. We are a busy people, but none of us are busier than Jesus was. None of us are busy as Jesus was. He came to seek and to save the lost, and yet he made time for prayer and devotion to God. Jesus knew that he could not exhaust himself in the needs of others at the expense of growing distant from God. And so throughout his ministry, you see that Jesus will take time away from the others and go to a desolate place. And there he will pray, especially emphasized in the Gospel of Luke. But I love how in Mark chapter 1, it shows us that life, life gets busy. Jesus is doing all types of things. In fact, he can't even really get away that long to pray because what happens? The disciples come out them and they say, Hey, Jesus, where have you been? Everybody's looking for you. Let's go back to the town. He's so busy, they want him to go back. And what does he say? No, we have to continue doing my work. We're going to go on to the next city. He had work left unfinished almost in one sense. But if my busy life and my busy schedule... If that's something that keeps me from prayer and from God, I'm too busy. 
Personal devotion to God, it's something that takes time. And if prayer was necessary for Jesus, how much more necessary is it going to be for us? Something we need to learn from this encounter in Mark chapter 1. Spiritual growth, spiritual intimacy, spiritual communion, that takes time. And a simple suggestion here could be Mark 135. We need to find our wilderness, find our desolate place, to go out and pray. I'm not saying drive the Moab, go down the desert and literally find your wilderness there. Find your time to talk with God. Devote that to Him. Another distraction we need to under another warning about distractions we need to understand is they can really mute and silence the urgency of Scripture. That all of a sudden the things we read about in the in Scripture, it's not really changes I need to make in my life right now. It's something that can be pushed off for another time. Do we remember what Hebrews 9 27 tells us? It's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. It's two dates in your life that are going to come one way or the other. Maybe you won't die on this earth. Maybe you will be a part of the lifetime, uh, the generation when the Lord will return. That would be great. But if not, you're going to die. And then comes the judgment. And sometimes death and judgment seem so far away. You know, it's almost as if here in America, we're too busy to die. We're, we're, we're too busy to think about that. We have too much going on. I can't, I can't die tomorrow. Uh, who's going to attend that 10 o'clock meeting that I have? No, but that's just how our minds work. We focus on this small portion of our physical life and fail to realize that God has set eternity in our hearts. God has placed eternity there. And we forget the urgency that we read about in Scripture. Urgency that prompts us to action and, and never put God on the back burner. Because God's Word is very clear. Old and New Testament. Our bodies on this earth aren't designed. They aren't meant to live forever. And that's something we need to consider. Something that we need to think about. You know, I wrote about the, this week in the weekly encouragement that I don't think we stop to think about heaven enough. And some of you are thinking, oh man, I didn't read the weekly encouragement. And that's okay, I'm not going to take that personally. But maybe you should. It talks about heaven. Something that we need to stop and think about. How often do we think about heaven? Rejoicing in the promise of eternity. Maybe we don't say Maranatha quite enough because we don't mean it. We don't want the Lord to return quickly. Because we got a lot going on right now. But if that's our attitude, let me say, you are too distracted. This earth is not our final resting place. We need to stop trying to find permanency in a place that is temporary. That's not the point. And so let's not mute the urgency of God's word in our life today. Writers in Old and New Testament were concerned with God's people living like God's people. And part of that means us responding to God's word and having an understanding of what it teaches. And so as we finish here, and I'm not going to give this probably the time that it, it deserves here. But I do want to throw some of these out. Maybe some of you look at your own life throughout this lesson. You realize that your phone, your screen time as a whole, maybe not your phone, but TV, it's a problem in your house. Can I offer a few suggestions, some tips to maybe improve that and make some instant changes in your life? And the first is turn off all non-essential notifications. I'm sorry, we don't need a notification every time someone liked our photo. We don't need a notification that Candy Crush is ready to be played. We, we don't need these nonsense, all these notifications that just pick away at our time. What are they trying to do? Get us back to our phone. Get us back to that application. And so turn those babies off. Mute it. We don't need that anymore. And similar to that, maybe better than just muting the notifications, maybe we just delete the app itself. If you're serious... Matthew 5, 28 through 30 gives a pretty good idea of what we should do. Cut it off. Especially if something that we're struggling with, if this is tied to pornography at all, if you are struggling with something in that realm on your phone, delete the app. Or better than that, and this is not something I have on the PowerPoint, you don't need a phone to go to heaven. And I know that will look so weird in our society today. Someone that doesn't have a cell phone or... Maybe you don't need a smartphone. There's ways to get around that. But social media and games, some of that just takes away our time. Something else we can do is keep our phone out of the bedroom. You know that nearly 80% of smartphone users sleep with the phone within arm's reach. 
And nearly 40% of college students that they did in the study found that they slept with their phone like a teddy bear, tucked in their arm. We can't get away from it. And how we start and how we end our day reveals a lot about our focus. And so if the last thing that I see before I go to bed is social media or my phone or my work emails, and the first thing that I see when I wake up is my phone and all those same things, the notifications and the things, why do you think people are having higher blood pressure problems? What, the first thing they see in the morning is stress and anxiety right in the face. Leave it out of your bedroom. And I know everybody says, well, it's my alarm clock. I, I looked it up before I presented this on Amazon. There's like $5 alarm clocks that you can buy. I'm not saying I'm going to buy everybody here an alarm clock, but I'll help you out if, if, that's really a, if that's really the problem. We need to also recognize that what we respond to can wait. We feel, that, feel this need that when someone reaches out to us, someone texts us, that we need to respond right away. I, first of all, I wish we had that type of urgency with God's Word. That's what we were just talking about. That's how we need to respond to God's Word. But, okay, I'm sorry. That if you text someone and they demand a response in the next 30 minutes, they can wait. If it's really urgent, they can call you. Because we don't do that anymore. And that's when we know something is actually wrong if someone calls or FaceTime. But understand that it's okay if you leave your phone off to the side for a few hours. It doesn't need to be urgently responded to. There's great self-restricting apps that we can use. Built-in apps. Apple recognizes. I mean, you go to their website, there's a lot of studies that Apple has done. They realize, and Samsung as well, they've created a problem. I mean, they've done exactly what marketers dream to do. Create a consumer need. And they've done that, and now they have a problem. People are addicted to their smartphones. And so there's great apps to help you limit your usage, cut you off when you hit 15, 30, an hour on an app. If you really want to know if you struggle with this, hey, invite feedback from those closest to you. Warning, you may not like the answer. You may think that it's not a problem for you in your life, but ask your family. Ask your kids. That's when we can really get some sobering feedback from that. We need to be present with others. And what I mean by that is when we're with family, leave the phone off the table. Leave the phone in a different room. You know, something Haley and I try to do, we're not the best at it. We, we have a bowl, and when we got home, we would typically put our phones in the bowl. And I'll admit, we don't do that as well as we would both like. We used to, but we need to be better about it. But that's a great idea. When you get home, phones go in a bowl because we're here with family. And that creates not just a bond with family, but hopefully time for Scripture, time for God. And lastly, something that can be helpful is just try a digital detox. Fasting, but for your phone. Reminding ourselves that our mind is in control of the body. My mind is in control of my impulses. That I'm not dominated by, by anything that I feel, any, anything that just comes over me. Typically, we think about that with food. But it expands well beyond food, but also that of our phone. And so as a familiar book is titled, we need to live like a Mary in a life, in a Martha world. I just butchered that title, but we need to make sure we are living a singular life centered on Jesus in the midst of so many distractions. Let's let Jesus be our portion. Let Jesus fill and be our cup. I hope you understand Jesus died on the cross that you could be saved from your sins. And if you're here this morning and you've not come to Jesus, that means that you remain in your sin. And that's a serious place to be. That means you need Jesus. You need the atonement and the forgiveness that His sacrifice provides. And so we have to come to Jesus and come on His terms. Coming to Jesus in faith. It's not possible without faith. Believing, motivating us to do what He says. Repenting of the sin in our, lot, in our life. Confessing Him as the Son of God. And being baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That's the beginning of our journey. And so that's a great song that we're going to sing here for the invitation. If you're here in subject to heaven's invitation, I invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing this song.